Good morning. My name is Sarah Fossoltz. I serve as the board administrator for the Texas State Board of Social Worker Examiners. I'd like to begin with a roll call. Chair Brumley? Present. Ms. Andrade? Present. Ms. Graham? Could not attend. Mr. Morris? It's on mute. Present. Thank you so much. Ms. Moser could not attend. Ms. Romsbacher? Here. Thank you. Ms. Rogers could not attend. Ms. Sines Davila? Present. Thank you. And Ms. Swartz could not attend. We have a quorum of five members. Chair Brumley. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Five, for showing up. And uh, I know those that weren't able to had um, valid reasons that they're doing something today. So we'll go ahead and get started. We'll call the meeting to order. And uh, we do have a quorum as confirmed by the roll call. So we'll move on to agenda item number two. Um, in your packet, discussion and possible action to elect a vice chair for Title 22 of the Texas Administrative Code, 781-207 elections. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Martha. Martha and I came on the board together whenever we came on the board. And <laughs> Martha has served well um, during, I, I guess, two, I don't know how many terms, but anyway, Martha's been around and has been very helpful and her insight and she's led, I think she's led the rules committee and something else. I don't remember. Licensing. Licensing committee. So thank you, Martha, for your service to the board and, and to the um, citizens and social workers of the state of Texas. So now having done that, is, is there any, any of you who, um, would like to be considered for vice chair. The role of vice chair uh, manages meetings uh, in the event that I was were to be absent. And other than that, um, you know, the vice chair can be um, involved in discussions of topical information and information related to certain committees. So, well, I would, I, Dolores, I was, you have a question? No, no, no. Oh, well, go, go right in. I was going to see if, Doris, you would entertain the, uh, Dolores, if you would entertain the uh, a motion to be vice chair. Oh, <laughs> um, sure. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, all those, so I, so I would make a motion that uh, Dolores uh, Sanz Davila would be, uh, Vice Chair of the Texas State Board of Social Work Examiners uh, would entertain a second. Oh, second. Ben Morris seconded. So um, all those in favor signify by raising your hand. Any opposed? Hearing, seeing none. Welcome to the Vice Chairmanship or Vice Chair. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. We'll move on to agenda item number three, board review and possible action regarding appeals of application or licensure denials, including Sonia Gentry. So in your packet, and I don't remember, this packet didn't, it's not in the order. It's not, uh, I mean, it's, it's in order, but you have to look for it. Um, do you know what page hers is, Sarah? It's in the folder. So mine are just all. Oh, I'll give, I'll bring it up. Okay. Later. Yeah, I didn't. Okay. So briefly, Miss Gentry's application was denied um, due to a uh, criminal history, and that information was in your packet for you. Let me see if Miss Gentry, uh, she was invited to the meeting. Let me see if she has is in attendance. We have twenty four attendees. Let's see her. Do you want to ask her to raise her hand and if she is in attendance? That's an excellent idea. <laughs> what a smart attorney you are. Law school <laughs> paid off, huh? <laughs> At least today. I don't see her on the list. I, I did a search for Sonia and a search for Gentry, and I don't see a hand raised. 
So if she were, if she, had she been in attendance, she would have been allowed a, few, uh, a number of minutes for addressing the board with any new information. So um, the board will have to struggle through with the information that staff provided, and hopefully that's enough to make a determination. Attorney Patrick, do you want to speak to Ms. Gentry's case, or was that another attorney? Um, well, I, I think I can just very briefly sum up uh, sum up the problem that she's run into, and unfortunately, this is you're gonna, going to see this as a reoccurring theme. Is Chapter 108 of the Occupations Code only applies to uh, well ap applies to several different um, uh, several different uh, uh, license types, but the only ones that cover us are psychology and social workers. And in Chapter 108, if you have been convicted or placed on deferred adjudication for any sort of felony felony offense uh, involving use or threat of force, the statute says that. The, the agency shall deny. So it really doesn't give much discretion. And that's why the, the staff issued the uh, denial. Um, and, uh, you know, that she has a right to appeal. And uh, that's where we are today. So um, I don't see that there's really much, there's much discretion at all here. But uh, again, if there's any questions, or if you guys want to discuss, um, just let me know. I'll, I'll try to answer them as best I can. So Patrick, I don't have any questions specifically about this situation, but is this in general where in, in occupation code in 108, does it allow us to look at a situation where something's been expunged or is when it's been expunged, we wouldn't know what happened? Is that right? Right. If it was expunged, it wouldn't exist. It wouldn't technically exist anymore. Right. So we okay. wouldn't. Um, it's not a conviction then, but if you've been convicted or placed on deferred adjudication, uh, you know, and that's a, that's, you can't, you wouldn't be able to produce the documents if it was expunged to prove that conviction. So, okay. um, so I don't think that would apply, but yeah, if in this instance, the documents exist, the conviction stands or the deferred adjudication stands. Okay. Uh, I, I so don't so yeah. he hearing that, um, I would, um, make a motion to let the um, situation stand as staff has decided that it is denied. I'll second that. I have a second from Audrey. All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Okay, does pass. Five, no, there are motion carries and, 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 and it is moved forward. So um, folks out there that, that are listening, um, th there is a process where you you can preemptively reach out to the board, and there is a fee associated with it. I think it's one hundred and fifty dollars. Is that do you remember that Sarah? for the for criminal the history criminal evaluation history. letter? Yeah, there is a process called criminal history evaluation, and the board will will look at that from the from from your history until the point they review it. If they reviewed it today, Cinco de Mayo. Um, anything that happened after that is not is is not inclusive of that of that letter that review. But you can you can know well in advance of seeking licensure if there's something in your background that would inhibit or prohibit licensure. If it is something that's covered under 108, you can go another step. Um, I am not an attorney, and you would have to reach out to one to find out about the process to go through an expunction. Is that a word? Expunction? Is that the word, Patrick? Okay, you, an, yeah. an expunction process of your criminal history. Um, that's between you and the court system. So, Ms. Gentry, if you see this later, that is that would be uh, what would need to happen if you want to reapply. And I'm... Um... If I could add, yes, the criminal history evaluation letter, it, its primary intent is for someone as they are beginning or before they enroll in a program so that they're not spending years and thousands and thousands of dollars on a degree for which they cannot obtain the license afterward. So that's the, to my mind, the primary function of that evaluation letter. Yes. And Attorney Patrick, Correct me, but I believe that Chapter 108 specifically calls out psychologists and social workers. So it, for someone in this situation, there may be um, 
there may be an opportunity for licensure under another profession, such as professional counselors or um, marriage and family. Well, I'm not sure about marriage and family therapists because they got something strange in their chapter. Um, but there may be other avenues for licensure, just not social work because it's specifically called out in this chapter. You're correct. The automatic denial under 108 does not apply to the other two boards, uh, the LPC or MFT board. Well, but there may be other provisions that apply, right? So each, so that it would have to be looked at specifically for that license type. Um, correct. And no, we we couldn't say at this time whether she would be approved or not. Okay. All right. Ms. Davila has. Oh yes. Numbers. Yes, I was just curious about um, if this is something that that she could have been made aware of before through her school, or is this something that personally she would have to ask of the so board? I can, I can answer that from one university, the one I work oh, okay. for. Okay. Um, we, um, <laughs> we do well in advance of someone coming into social work because, because an undergraduate degree in social work is something you start in your junior year, pretty much across right. everywhere. Um, the university systems in Texas have a thing at freshman orientation where they are provided with information about degrees that are offered at that institution that could result in licensure. And if in, and you know, I mean, that's nursing, counseling, social work, you know, in, uh, CPAs, I anything. Mm -hmm. They are given a documented orientation that gives them information about licensure process and how that's not part of the educational process. It's subsequent to the education. Right. So they sign that, but I promise you, they're freshmen. They don't remember. They don't pay attention to that. That's mm -hmm. a thing that was put in place. And here again, this is my version of it, um, to protect universities from being sued because that's what happened. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that student won the case many years ago. So, yeah. so students are made aware when they come into the social work program in their intro to social work class, we do provide that information. And then further into their career, when they apply to their internship, they're given that information again. So along the way, I can yeah. attest to three different points at our university where they are given that freshmen, then a couple of years, you know, then then a year or two okay. later, and then a few months later. So um, that's that's how it works. And I think it works that way in most other places as well. Okay. Thank you. All right. And board members, I've, I need to call to your attention. I forgot to look for uh, people who are attending by phone. And we do have one call-in person who might be Miss Gentry. So I'd like to take a moment and allow her to allow the caller to unmute and identify whether they are not, whether they are Miss Gentry or not. Good morning, caller. Are you um, are you Sonia Gentry? I am not, Sarah. This I am not, Sarah. This is Daryl. Okay. okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, we'll ignore that number from now on since it's Daryl. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that concludes that agenda item. Uh, have, have, we don't we don't have any more under that. Um, no, just that one. Just that you. one. And then, so agenda item number four: board review and possible action regarding agreed orders to be executed by the board. And they're in your packet. But does anybody have any questions? And Sarah can give a brief a brief review. So these are uh, this is orders to be executed by the board. And to my knowledge, there are none. The the ones that are in the packet are under agenda item number six. Oh, okay. All right. So that ends four. We'll go to agenda item five, board review and possible action regarding contested cases from State Office of Administrating Hearings or SOA, including Sharice Robinson West. Is that Patrick? You want to talk about that? Yes. Or uh, Sarah, Brian uh, Clark is the attorney who handled that, and he is in the attendees. He's not on the panelists. Okay. Can you promote him? I can. All right. We'll move from Patrick to Brian. There he is. Well, did he come over? Promote to panelist. Where'd he go? There, there he is. is. Morning. Morning, Brian. Good morning. So this is just another 108 case. Um, 
It has come before this board before the application was denied. She then appealed and we took the case to SOA. Uh, the SOA judge agreed and issued a proposal for decision, also denying her application. And now we need to take it to BHEC. So I've drafted a final order for BHEC to sign and we need you guys to approve it. So in your, in your information, there is the uh, final decision and it basically just says that, you know, findings of fact support our decision. So, sure. um, and, and Brian, so this would go to the, to the BHEC meeting just as a formality as we approve it, then BHEC looks at it, any questions we would answer and then it's approved there. That's right. And they would, they would sign it. Okay. Um, they being Gloria, I guess. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, well, any any questions, board members, about this situation? And, and let's let. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Check and see if the uh, respondent or applicant is here and give oh. her an opportunity. Absolutely. Speak. If if she is here, can she raise her hand? Miss Roberts Robertson West. I don't see. She's not in the list, Patrick. Oh, okay. Um, that, that I see. I'm just doing a quick search to while, make sure I haven't missed it. While Sarah's doing that, Brian and Patrick, is are, are these 108 cases something that are increasing in number to us? I don't know if it's a, Brian, I don't know if it's going up. We, we get them every so often, but the problem is, is people it doesn't the difficulty with 108 is it's not very forgiving this could have happened five years ago 10 years ago or 15 years ago they just happened to apply with us and since it was an act this statute was enacted by the legislature back in 2019 we don't really have any discretion it doesn't give us discretion to say right. it was 20 years ago and you know unfortunately it's just shall deny so yeah. um uh that's where these come up, but I—I I mean, they come up every so often. I don't know if it, they're increasing necessarily. But um, okay. Brian, do you think they're increasing? No, I, I haven't seen an increase. It's, it's about the same. We get we get okay. them every now and then. Steady. Um, do we need a a motion and a vote of approval of the order? Yes, please. Okay. All right. I would entertain a motion. Everybody's mute. Audrey, you're unmuted. Are you making a motion? Or she... Yes, oh. I make a motion to do the order as it stands. Okay. I second. I have a motion from Audrey, a second from Dolores. All those in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries and agenda item number five will be support of the denial letter moving to BHEC. Okay. Now on agenda item number six, that's the one that's in your packet that has the report of agreed orders executed by the council's executive director. And you, do you have a rundown on those? Are there, I know they're in the packet. Uh, they're in the packet. I'm happy to an, um, answer any questions if you have of those agreed orders. And the agreed orders are, are the ones typically at this point staff have reviewed, uh, the attorneys have reviewed, and they've been sent to, I guess, Daryl for signature. They, they will be sent to Daryl for signature upon approval. So the, they already have been sent to Daryl, and he did sign them in approval. Okay. So this, they've already been executed. This is a report after the fact. Okay. So any questions about those? All right. Seeing none. We don't need to um, no vote on no that. no vote on that. We need to move to seven, which is a report out from the uh, report of cases dismissed by the council's executive director. And there were how many? Was it forty? Forty cases okay. dismissed. And if there's uh, if there was a report in your um, in your packet. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer any of those. All right. Any questions on the report? Uh, seeing the head shaking no. All right. We'll move on then to 
agenda item eight, status report of quarterly enforcement activities. That report is... So that report is in your packet. Um, again, if you have any questions or any comments to make on the report, I'll be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. So it looks like, what do we have, 144 out there pending? For social work, yes. Yeah, yeah. so 144 are pending. Um, Only one priority case. Okay. And Mr. Chair, this is from, from this is as of February 28th. So um, yeah. last yeah. I spoke with Alfonso, the enforcement manager, I think these numbers are still trend, continuing to trend down. Good deal. Yeah. Yeah. They're working. I, I think our our process of the the using the sanction matrix or whatever it's called is is working and allowing staff to be expedient in the in the use of that process brings those numbers way down from when I came on the board yes. years ago. And the process is much quicker. And um, so far, I haven't had any any blowback from anybody that it's not working. So, all right. Any questions on that status report that y'all had in your packet there? All right. Seeing none, we'll move on to agenda item number nine, uh, report of compliance with agreed orders. So board members, this is a confidential report that's just in your packet. It's not released to the public. Um, but if you have any questions, I'll try to answer your questions. How many of those were there? Do you remember? There's like four. Four? Okay. Five. Five. There's five of them. Um, so five cases are being monitored for compliance with the agreed order. Yeah. And and that monitoring process is most of them have, have supervision requirements or things like that that they have to report Continuing in. education yeah. and things. Yeah. Administrative penalties are paid, that kind of thing. Okay. Okay. All right. So now we are down to agenda item number 10. Uh, discussion and possible action concerning the board's February 2nd, 2023 town hall gathering, public comment concerning, uh, we have uh, mainly A and B, stakeholders experience with the Associated and Social Work Board's national exam. Um, we'll just take these one at a time. We'll, we'll go over that one first. Okay. Uh, so we did, I attended that uh, that town hall and, and listened uh, to the folks who, who called in on a Zoom meeting. Um, we had some, uh, we had a good opportunity to discuss the, what the public saw as limitations, what the public saw as, you know, a, a test of minimum standards. Uh, so the, dis the discussion wasn't about, do we, do we do away with the exam? I mean, of course there is some, there, there is a, a group that would, would, like to see that there's also you know a group that understands that you know to maintain the professionalism of social work there has to be some sort of minimum standard process that moves moves you forward to licensure so we talked about all kind of alternatives and heard from from the public and uh sarah and i attended sarah you have any major feedback from it that that you want to talk about uh, I, I was struck by the the just the the heartbreaking experiences of someone who's attempted the exam time and time again. Um, would like to encourage um, those who who have attempted the exam that ASWB does have some resources that they've recently enacted. Um, uh, one of them is a is a. a what they they call it a, a testing mindset. And they've contracted with a company called Fifth Theory. Um, so you can you can go to ASWB. They'll so someone who's um, recently failed the test about a week after they um, attempt the exam, they'll get an email from ASWB and be invited to participate in uh, Fifth Theory services. It's free to the test taker. There's no cost. Um, and the, the hope is that it will help them cope with the anxiety and the emotional stress that builds up from repeated attempts. 
Um, ASWB also has resources for educators so that um, those who are involved in uh, academic programs can help their students get prepared for the test. Supervisors can also use uh, the materials for educators to help their supervisees get ready, for example, for the clinical exam. Um, and the ASWB guidebook for the exam includes materials that can help you make a study plan for an individualized study plan for yourself, as well as a lot of information about what to expect on that day, again, to help reduce anxiety and that kind of thing. So please um, use those resources to help you be as best prepared. Um, and um, ASWB is continuing to look at things. They've, um, they've announced funding for research. And um, so you, you might wanna uh, look into that if you're interested in doing a research project to help understand what's going on with the disparity in, that's shown by the pass rate, but may not necessarily be the exam itself, but might be reflective of other societal disparities that people are, are challenges that people are dealing with. That was my and, long winded and impression. That, yeah, it was, it was, I don't know, we were there for what, two, three hours. It was a long, it was, it was a pretty it was a good meeting. meeting. Yeah, it, it was a pretty good long meeting. And, and it was just primarily an opportunity for us to listen. Um, I will tell those that, that uh, if, if any of the public is out there, um, those, that information has been shared um, with ASWB um, so that they have access to hearing the public's uh, information that are, are the tech Texas public's information at least. Um, one of the things too that that Sarah mentioned is that proposal it, it's live now so folks can apply um, if you've got contact with any universities you know where you went to school whatever encourage folks who are interested in doing research to look at that RFP uh, that, that is funded through ASWB to do this research. A decision will be made in August about where the, or, or a, a, a research application will be approved or, or selected in August and I guess approved in November maybe at the delegate assembly. I don't know exactly the time frame, but I know August to November. I know in August we're looking at them and in Dece and in November, I think we will vote on them. So, um, good or bad, I've been appointed to the committee to choose. So, um, who gets the oh. the funding? So, I know we're meeting in August. So, we will make our decision in August, and we'll see what happens there. So, any questions about that? Any any insight or input from any of y'all about the uh, uh, ASWB minimum standards test? All right. So then um, impact or, or item number 10 B impact of recent continuing education rule changes on field instructors. And actually, I mean, we, we've got information there, but we have it also in our agenda under 11. I know it's, it's under, 12. under 12. OK, so we can talk about it now. And then when we get to 12, we can talk about it again if we need to and, and take action. But here would just be um, opportunity about the town hall meeting that we had. And there was also, so we sort of split the town hall meeting or we tried to split it into two pieces so that we had the listening about the exam and then the change that was made that removed the opportunity for someone who is a field instructor to, to receive CEs for performing that duty. And the, um, the feedback was primarily put it back. <laughs> that's, that's the simple short answer that we got over and over is that those continuing ed hours need to be put back into rule so that field instructors will be able to earn those CEs. Um, my fear was that there would be a loss of individuals interested in continuing to do internship activities with students. And um, that seemed to be some of the information that we got that day is that there were several who came, several field instructors who came on and said, you know, the, the, this is a cost benefit process and you've removed the benefit. So, 
we don't we may not want to do this anymore so and um we had we had lots of of field instructor or field field faculty from universities that also support the move to put it back so did you have any anything to add to that one sarah no. nope all right any questions or discussion from any board members about the town hall meeting um, no i was just curious as to why it was removed initially um or i don't know if the was patrick the, or it was part of the standardization committee's recommendation uh, to help uh, staff streamline things and um, get things more standardized across all of the boards. Attorney Patrick, do you have more insight into that? No, that was kind of really what I was going to talk about is that we went through with all the other, all the four boards. And one of the issues I think was, uh, depending on which board it was, sometimes they had four continuing education rules or three or, or, and what we're looking to do is consolidate them all and all the requirements into one rule uh so that if you have a continuing education continuing education question you go to one rule not not four you don't you forget to check the third or the fourth one for the answer you're looking for but we also look to understand the standardization community to try to make them as similar as possible so that when you look at one sometimes people have multiple licenses through multiple boards and to try to make them you know uh match up as best as possible and so some of the things we did was take it was while they're, they're not they're not mirror images of each other each each board is is slightly different uh and some of that can't be avoided because the licenses are different some of them were just decisions of those boards but uh this was taken out i think part of that part of the, the through that process it was taken out but one of the other th the issues that came up i think in the standardization committee about looking at this was um I can't remember exactly which board it was. I, I, I want to say it was MFT, but I may be remembering this incorrectly. They used to give continuing education credit for providing supervision to an associate license licensee. And a lot of the, the standardization committee looked at that and said, well, th that's really giving somebody, you're doing your job, you're doing something that you're you're being paid by the associate to do possibly. And and it's just your normal job you do. And that's not in continuing education is usually something you go do beyond your day to day job to then get extra education, you know, to enrich your enrich yourself and, and, and make yourself a better licensee. And so uh, maybe it's my misunderstanding of what, you know, field instructors do, but there was a, a general sense that a lot of people looked at that and said, this is really sort of a, a parallel situation where you have a a supervisor and associate and they're they're sort of doing something that um you know they're getting credit they're getting uh looked at almost like a double dipping sort of sort of a thing so and that, yeah, that makes that, sense that's why it was taken out and and one of the reasons that that um we're looking at bringing it back is is in in social work i know dolores katie and audrey y'all y'all know and being the public member that you know field field internship is a is a required part of the degree at both the undergrad and graduate levels and the people who, who I think sometimes terms get in the way here Patrick is using the term soup field supervisor um, we use the term field instructor um, and, and because that while yes they are supervising them it is an educational process that's an extension of their university education that happens in the field. So we view the we universities view those field instructors as an integral part of the teaching process to become a social worker. And there is no they're not paid and it's not a, it's not a normal part of their duties. You know, once you graduate and go out there, you have to you have to decide and determine I want to be a volunteer field instructor. So that's primarily what, what happened and the um, and the process was then put out there that where we changed the rule and we're now at a looking point where we can maybe go back and replace CEs for those field, in, field instructors in social work. So, any more discussion about that? And we'll just hold off to agenda item 12 and, and then look at it for, for a vote. Okay. 
If I could speak to agenda item uh, 10C, other comments, just so you're aware, other comments that were received during the town hall related to um, the postcard notice that oh, yeah. licensees get for renewal. Um, one commenter opined that that was not enough to prompt her to renew her license. Um, just want to remind folks that whether they receive the postcard or not, it is still the licensee's responsibility to know when their license needs to be renewed and to make sure that that gets taken care of. And so. yeah, and that, you know, I, I was a little perplexed at about how that's an extra step the board takes to remind folks, um, you know, once you earn this license, it's an important piece of your practice. It's, you know, kind of like there's no excuse to, to just let it go. Uh, we all know the month we were born in, hopefully, and the only other piece of information you have to know is, am I an odd or even year? So if you know your birthday month, and if you're odd or even for your renewal, then, you know, I'm an odd number. This was 23. I was born in February. So mine's due again in February 25. Just tuck that away and, and move on. Um, the, the postcard, if you get the postcard, uh, it comes usually 60 days. Is that the target date? So so because I thought I got mine sometime in December mm -hmm. for my February renewal. And you have until the end of the month that you were born in of that year you're due for renewal to get it done. Um, I, I was a so in 21, when I renewed in February, the rule didn't come out for fingerprints, I think, till April. So I didn't have to fingerprint in 21. So in 23, I had to do all the things. So, and it was, I mean, use our website. Uh, Tim Spear and his folks have done a good job of linking things out there for you to find how to do the fingerprint process, how to do the renewal, all the steps. So it's there. Um, and th this, is, this is your license. And I want you all to understand the importance of maintaining it in a timely manner um, because delinquency go, let's see, it's, Delinquent and then expired. No. Okay, am I getting them right? So it's delinquent. You know, if mine would have went delinquent on March first, it goes delinquent the day after it's due. Um, then you're in delinquent status until you have a time period of not one year. One year, and then it expires, and then you have to go through the reinstatement process, and that's a fairly costly process. Yes, um, it's five to seven hundred dollars is what I've been hearing folks say. So. Um, to, to get reinstated. Uh, you don't have to retest if you have a passing score, is my Correct. understanding. We, we have had some, uh, some individuals who were grandfathered in, so they've held their license for decades and decades, but they, they allowed it to expire, and um, they were required to have a passing ASWB score, so they had to test before they could reinstate their license. And so that's an extra two or $300. Yeah. So it's, it's important to, important. you know, keep, keep your things, keep your things, get, get you a folder, put your renewal date on it and keep your CEs in it and take care of your life. All right. So that was 10 A, B, and C all discussion and review of the town hall. I thought the town hall worked. Okay. We may do another one if we have some uh, things that we want to talk about. So watch for those. All right. Item, agenda item number 11, discussion and possible action concerning public comment on proposed rules published in the December 16th, 2022 Texas Register and recommendations to the Texas Behavioral Health Executive Council, hereafter known as the Council, concerning possible adoption of proposed changes to 22 Texas Administrative Code, including, and we'll start with A, 781401 qualifications for licensure to remove the 48 and six month maximums for completing supervised experience for for uh, licensure as a licensed clinical social worker or LCSW or for non-clinical independent practice recognition IPR respectively so let's just take these as they come so that's a um, any input there Sarah uh, I, I don't have anything to add to that. 
Um, we're just doing 401? Or we're doing, we'll, doing we'll just take them one at a time. Okay. Yeah, we'll just take them one at a time. So um, uh, the materials were in the packet. I believe there was um, a public comment for that. There was one, I think. I'm going to have to look at yours, mine's. And Sarah, can I just add real quickly? Um, there was a small typo in the materials, I think. Um, in 404, I think. In 781 404. Oh, yes. the next one is the. In 401 in the board materials, um, it's it has the at least 24 months and the at least is struck through in the board materials. Ah, wrong one. Thank what, you. Yeah, what, what was published in the register, it, the at least is being added. Uh, and so um, that that is being included, it, that was included in the pub, in the published one. It just is a, a small little typo where it's underlined and struck through and it should just be, that's new and we're keeping that. Just wanted to make that um, clarification. For yeah, um, the, yeah, just the layman that with people here. Yeah, that, thank you. Can, you it, it both struck through, and yeah, that's my that's my typo. I'm sorry. And just in in layman's terms, what what this basically means is that once you start supervision for your LCSW, it's going to take you 24 months, but we're removing the the open end, um, and we're removing the top end time limit. I yeah, guess so. Right? It's no longer a window. Yeah. So if you don't get 3,000 hours within 48 months, you're, you're not, um, that's not going to be a, an issue in the, in the, again, if the board approves yeah, yeah. and if the council approves, um, that won't be an issue, that wouldn't be an issue in the future. But right now, as the rule stands, you have to complete the 3,000 hours plus the 100 hours of supervisory sessions over at least 24 months, but not to exceed 48 months. So if it takes you 60 months to get 3,000 hours, your window kind of has to move until you have a magical no more yeah. than 48 months with 3,000 hours in it. Um, that hasn't been as much of an issue as the five-year rule that was um, repealed recently uh, within the last year or so. Um, but this one does, a couple of people do bump up into this um, especially um, young mothers who might be taking off time for um, maternity leave or for raising a young child, that kind of Your thing. Your speaker is not working. Can y'all not hear us? I can hear you. They're nodding. Okay. Yes. We just got a notice that our speaker's not working. Please but... check your connection or use a different speaker. Well, if y'all can hear us, somebody in the public out there, I guess, it, I guess everybody can hear us. We'll just go with yeah. it. So... Um, so Maria, if you're listening, Maria is our wonderful IT person. If you're listening, you might come uh, check on us. <laughs> so, and, and the thought process behind these rule change or this rule change is that, you know, the individual who's seeking that, that LCSW licensure and Dolores may want to speak to this. I mean, the goal is to get it done so you can move on test and, and practice. So I don't think there's any any efficacy in the fact that having to do it in this window of time makes you any better or any worse as a social worker. It's, it's no, I that think it'll the motivate goal people. is you need to come forward with your own time frame and fit it in. It's going to take you two years. You know that. And if you can hit it at that two year mark, then move on with your magic and pass your test and become an LCSW. So, um, uh, so these are, these have been, let me get this all right. And Patrick, you or Sarah can maybe help me here. This has been in the register. It's already had public comment. We're going to, we can take action today and then it'll move forward to the BHEC meeting. Is that all right, Patrick? Okay. But we have to actually take a vote on each of these or we can combine them at the end. Okay. Yeah. Sure. We'll just, we'll just combine the vote and do one vote after all the discussions. So, Okay. All right. So let's move on to B, which is 781-404, recognition as a council approved supervisor and the supervision process to remove the 48 and 60 month maximums for completing the supervised experience for LCSW or IPR <clears throat> to provide minimum standards for the 40 hour training required, excuse me, Bless. to apply for supervisor status and to remove duplicative and outdated language. So this is changing the rule 
for folks who are LCSWS or LMSWIPRS, I guess, so that the same things were changing for the licensee are now being changed in the supervisory rule. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. So um, it's also in your packet. It, it's just making things the same across the board for supervisors and supervisees. So any discussion about it from anybody? All right, seeing head shaking no. We'll move on to C. Um, 781 for 21 remedy for incomplete license requirements to allow the board to make exceptions for applicants who have difficulty fulfilling certain re license, certain licensing requirements due to a declared disaster. Um, this, this comes out of COVID some way I remember us talking about, but it's, since COVID was a declared disaster, but also things, I mean, we have hurricanes in Texas. We have tornadoes up in my part of Texas. I don't know if y'all get them down here, but we, we love them along the Red River. Um, <laughs> they come often to visit. We have, um, I mean, we have droughts, we have fires, we have all kinds of things that happen, snowstorms, blackouts. Um, I just heard this morning, get ready for the summer. We may not have enough electricity. So, you know, all these things happen um, that can be declared an emergency. This gives the board the ability to say, yes, this was an actual reason for somebody not meeting some licensure requirement. And it can be done at the board level now, whereas before, did it have to be, it was just, there were none. Before, there, there, there wasn't much flexibility for the board to act. Yeah. So this gives the board some flexibility. Um, and uh, under certain circumstances has to be a declared disaster, yeah. not just a personal right. uh, tragedy. Yeah. You not paying your own light bill and not having Wi-Fi is not a declared disaster or, you know, death, death in a family or something that's very individualized. This is a broader, a broader statement. So, yeah. um, but again, it just, it's, it's a rule that's sort of new. It just gives the board some latitude in making some decisions. Um, I don't see us having to put it in place very much. Hopefully we don't have another major long disaster like we had with COVID, but um, it's here now. So we can we can vote on it, but we'll have to look at D. The D is the one we've already talked about, 781-501, requirements for continuing education. No, oh, no, that's a different one. Where's So we need, do we need to move back to the field instructor one? Because this one is just adding it to hospitals and stuff, or is it all in there? It's all in there. It's all in that well, same rule. So this, what you're looking at in, on 71501. So on D, yes. what you're looking at is what has already been proposed and published. Uh -huh. and, you're, and the board is looking to approve or recommend that for adoption, if they so choose, okay. to the council. And then on agenda item 12, 12. that would be brand new it language go through to, this process. to propose and it would need to then be published if the council approves. Gotcha. Okay. So 781-501-D, 11-D, is to add hospitals and hospital systems to subsection F and make January 1, 2024, the effective date of subsection F. This is adding hospitals and their systems as approved CE providers. Um, and hospitals is fairly broadly designed, uh, broadly defined. Um, so you can... Uh, be a psych hospital, medical medical hospital system, whatever whatever you are, um, will be included here. So, any questions about that one? Seeing none. All right. So, I would entertain a motion to agenda item eleven, subset A, B, C, and D, um, as having been published and ready for vote from the Texas State Board of Social Work Examiners to approve these items. I make a motion. A second. Dolores, you unmuted, but I didn't hear you. Oh, sorry, I make a motion to pass. She makes the motion to approve for adoption? Yes, to approve. Yes. Okay. Who is she talking through? I don't even hear her talking. I, I think second. that's the speaker. Oh, this speaker. That, so we that can't we're not hear here. Oh, okay. So it's coming through your computer speaker. Yeah, and I'm already up to 100. Okay. 
Well, all right. So Dolores has made a motion. So would someone like to second that? Audrey, you're unmuted. Does that mean that's what you're doing? I think Katie already did, but okay. somebody did. So Audrey has seconded the motion. All those in favor, raise your hand. I think it was Katie that seconded. Oh, Katie Audrey seconded was it. Saying, Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> all right. So Katie seconded. Now let's vote again. So everybody raise your hand. That voting yay. Any in yes. opposition? Seeing none. It does carry. So these will move to the BHEC meeting for approval. All right. Now then, we're on to number 12. Discussion and possible action concerning 22 Texas Administrative Code 781-501, requirements for continuing education and the effect of recent changes on programs recruiting field instructors. So we've talked about that also in your packet. Uh, the, the, there is an organization uh, in Texas called the Texas Field Educators Consortium, which is shortened that to TFEC. TFEC has um, put together a letter which was uh, provided in your board packet, and their, their letter is asking that, you know, the, so the Field Educator Consortium is a group of field faculty from the universities and the field placing uh, people in Texas. So they have come forward with a with an agenda, I mean, with a uh, letter in support of us returning the uh, information to the rule 781-501 that includes field instructors at, to receive CEs. Um, their their uh, letter has it at returning it to 10 CE hours per renewal period. So that would that would mean that a person could get five CEs for supervised program. They supervise them for 400 clock hours. And in a graduate program, depending on the kind of student they are, if they have a BSW, 500 more hours. If they do not have a BSW, they have to be 900 clock hours. So, but at any point, a field instructor would get five CEs for a semester, not to exceed 10 hours per renewal period. So within the two year, I mean, they could earn, you know, if they did it three semesters, they could earn, um, you know, the whole 30. But we're looking at not exceeding 10 CE hours per renewal period. So that that is not in the form of a motion. That is information from TFEC to us for discussion um, as, as sort of a starting point is does anyone have any input on that process? I have a question for Patrick. I don't know if this is the appropriate place for it, but um, are there other, I guess, field, like other than field instructors, are there other areas of practice where they could say that it's something similar where, well, I did this, so I should get this? Yeah. Um, so before I answer your question, I, I might make a suggestion. If if it's the will of the board and they want to look into this further, I might recommend that it, this be sent to a rules committee to for the committee to then draft up language and then bring back sort of a polished recommend, okay. re recommended language for a rule to be then proposed. Uh, but I'm not proposing a, it. I'm just it was more right. of a question. Yeah. Um. I so not my my general sense is no, is no. The best uh the best example I could think that's in the rule right now is it does talk about you know giving you can get um some credit for like taking a college level course or you can get it for preparing a course, but mm -hmm. that sort of thing caps out at five hours. Yeah. right now under it um i guess what would be helpful to to sort of understand uh and gather information for because i'll i'll plead a little bit of ignorance uh because i don't necessarily know everything that the field instructors do but um it's a it's an interesting dynamic because is it so this are the students required required to get field instruction and it's yes. part they get course credit for it right 
That is but, that is correct. But the universities then require people to then get teach teach field yes, instruction, they and they don't pay them at all for it. That is correct. And, oh. and now you're heavy on the word require. Um, so at, at my job at my university for for years now has been the director of field education. And so one of the things that happens, Patrick, is my job is to build relationships with agencies and organizations that where field, where social work happens so that I can then send a student there under an agreement that that student goes out into the work world and do, does those hours in an agency setting. We do not, the university does not pay those field instructors at those settings. Um, it, we do things like we offer free CEs to them above and beyond those that they can earn for just being a field instructor. Um, they have some university privileges, but there's no money exchanged at all. Okay. So it's a volunteer basis, but they have to develop a learning plan with that student. So, so there is an educational component that happens out there on the field instructor side to to have a student with them i think my concern is oh sorry patrick go ahead oh yeah well then maybe to better answer your question is is i i think there are possibly some parallels in some of the other uh, other boards because like for psych psychology um uh, a lot of the the people before they get a license have to get an internship and that internship is required mm -hmm. for their their university to graduate and they go out and, and get placed in the field at some other location that's not in the university and we don't give continuing education for those you know that psychologist that's supervising interns uh in a placement um, right. and, and i know lpcs require an internship uh for the for for uh their counseling degrees so um, I don't necessarily know how that's really different than psychology or or I think MFT does it as well. I think all of them require some form of internship or like psychology's internship and practicum. And and those oftentimes will be, you know, in a maybe a private practice setting, maybe a different uh, hospital setting somewhere else. And they're not necessarily, you know, employ employees of the university or getting paid by the university or and if they don't get CEs from us for that. Yeah, I know that there's a standardized uh, or they have to be approved to get CEUs. So that was my concern that it, it's not a standardized, like how do you determine other than, you know, the hours that you put in. Um, uh, Sarah, can you also, can you unmute Daryl? I think he wants to say something. Where do you go? Total one phone call. Oh, there he is. Director Spinks? Chair Rumley, can you hear me okay? We got you now. Okay. There, There is one, um, one of the issues that kind of came up in like standardization when we were looking at this is it's almost like we're subsidizing, uh, you know, the university's program by having to offer CE to entice people to do this. But uh, to directly to your question about does any other boards or Dolores' question, does any other boards do this? Psych just proposed a rule. I don't think it's been adopted yet, but we proposed one. Uh, where we are going to offer CE for individuals who will supervise people in underserved areas, uh, those those federally designated underserved areas. Uh, you you know people will be able to claim continue, half their continuing education credit for supervising. So that is one direct example. Now it's a different motivation, I think, than kind of what y'all are talking about. But uh, there there is precedent there if that's what if that's what Dolores was asking about. But uh, that's the only example that I can think of. Otherwise, the other professions do not offer continuing education just for the, the stock supervised experience required to get into the profession. Yeah. Yeah, my question, 
I, I think your answer makes sense, but my question was more like, are there other field, not just field instructors, but other people in the field who are asking for CEUs for the work that they're doing, which is kind of what Pratik was saying. Like, I, again, I don't know if this is the place for the discussion. So I think the- no, Dolores, I think I'm following what you're asking. And so a simple answer is, I've never run across anyone who's asking for hours or CEs outside of what's currently in policy because there right. is where you can do self-study. There is a self-study yeah. process and that's the most, to me, that's the most vague area that we have. Um, right. And that, that, that's my concern yeah, that it might never, be too vague. Yeah. I've never heard of a situation because to, to be a field instructor, you, you have, there, there is a, a vetting process that a university goes through with that person to approve them to be a field instructor. Mm -hmm. And then they have to actively be assigned a student within that semester to have received those hours historically. So that, I mean, they can't just pop up and say, hey, I'm on your list as a field instructor. I want my five hours. It, it was before it was the combination of they had to be pre-approved on the list, have a student placed with them for that entire semester. And then at the end, uh, they had to request those hours if they wanted them from the university is how it worked in the past. Um, so um, that's, that's for later, right? Unless you, unless you, it's your prerogative. If you want to take any input from outside so on, at this time, you it's always your prerogative. Okay, so we have a hand raised from the public that is um, Whitney Luce, who is the chair, I believe, of the Texas Field Educators Consortium. Board members, are y'all okay with hearing from her right now instead of waiting till the end? That's fine. Okay. With me. All right, will we please unmute and allow her to, to speak? So Whitney, we're asking you to, we're unmuting you and, and giving you uh, an opportunity, uh, just a short minute here to make a comment. Okay, thank you so much. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, I've been listening to the discussion and I definitely see the points that have been raised um, and wanted to address some of that. I know there um, was a question about, um, is this standardized? And I believe that Chair Brumley did speak to this a little bit, but um, I, I would say that it is standardized a bit by universities since you do have to be vetted to be a field instructor. Um, also field instructors are required to um, get educational hours with the universities in order to be field instructors. So they're having to stay up on current research and really um, do some of their own education in order to serve as field instructors for our social work students. Additionally, in Texas, we have many um, areas that are mental health um, worker shortage areas. And so in order to prepare social work students um, in those areas, many times we are trying to recruit field instructors to be off-site field instructors in rural areas, um, in organizations that do not have social workers. And we're hoping to change that as social work educators. And so we are trying to enlist off-site field instructors who provide supervision for students and meet with them weekly um, and those students are placed in organizations that do not have a social worker on site or someone who could provide that field instruction. And so I really see this as a, a threat to being able to recruit field instructors to do offsite supervision, particularly. I see it as a threat to being able to get field instructors in other organizations as well. But this is a way that we could really reach um, underserved areas, and we have a lot of those shortage areas um, in regards to mental health in Texas. Additionally, I think it's been mentioned already, but field instructing is generally not a um, required piece of a social worker's job. 
So it is not as though they are being offered um, or would be offered continuing education credit for a regular part of their job. It is um, going above and beyond and something that they are voluntarily doing. So thank you so much for your time. I'll be happy to clarify any of that or answer questions, but I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Okay, thank you for that, Whitney. Um, so I would, I mean, with, without, if, if there's further discussion, y'all just let me know, but I'd like to uh, propose that we send Agenda item 12, 781-501, requirements for continuing education um, and related to field instructors to rules committee. Do we need to vote to do that? Just pa Attorney Patrick, does that need to be a, a vote and a motion or just an instruction to staff? I, I mean, Mr. The, the chair can send it to the rules committee and then they can look at it. We're not making a formal action on this. So we're just yeah. trying to develop something. So, but if there's any other you know, indication of how you want it drafted, you can certainly say that now. Yeah, no, I don't have any indication other than I would like rules committee to review this for possible action and have it placed on the next board meeting agenda for, for action. All right, everybody okay with that? We'll move on then to agenda item number 13. Uh, Report out from committee chairs, um, A, ethics committee, I don't have anything to report. We, we have been rolling through uh, some ISCs. I know with Attorney Clark and um, Attorney Long, that's oh, Kenneth. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah, Kenneth, Ken, we, have a new, we have a new attorney um, that I've been working with some. So I know Ben and I have done some. Um, there he is. There he is. Um, and then we've done a couple, uh, I think I've done some with Ms. Rogers, um, and I guess that's all. So anyway, we have some coming up. I know uh, Kenneth and I have one set for the end of this month, I think, Kenneth, is that right? So yeah, um, we will um, keep using that process. I think we Zoom folks in. It seems to work fairly efficiently. Uh, hadn't had any real, real issues that have come up from that, so. All right, so that's my report there. Now we'll go to Licensing and Standards and Qualifications Committee. That's Ms. Mosier, who she is unable to be here. I can um, report that they did not meet okay. since the last meeting. Um, and uh, to my recollection, uh, no action has been taken by that committee via email, as we often sometimes do. Okay, so there's a report out on that. B, the Professional Development Committee. I know Sarah had sent sent me some changes that we made to sort of align new rules with the JP exam, and we've we've done that, right? Yes. Yeah, that's all. That all went, that went in effect last month. The rules became effective on March seventh. Okay. And um, the vendor reported that they were completed uh, that within a day or two. Okay. So, so those changes have been have been made to the JP exam. Yes. Um, I know we normally have a report out later about the JP exam. Do we have that's on the agenda? It's on the agenda. Yes. Yeah. So we'll do that. We'll do that soon. Uh, and then 13D is again uh, is a report out from Rules. Who is the chair? Is Miss Mosier, who is unable to be here today. So y'all got something to report. I know they met or they had. They, they, they have had not met. They had activity. Yet. They have not met since oh, the last, okay. but I do have, um, what I've done is make notes for when the rules committee next meets Okay. Um, for what to put on the rules committee's agenda when that, when that comes. Okay. But I will need, since Ms. Moser has um, officially been resigned uh -huh. by the governor's office from the board, I will need a rules committee chair okay. in order to proceed with the meeting. And you and I can deal with that after this meeting or okay. by email later on. And then we'll need to do that for, um, Licensing standards as well. Okay. Yeah. So we'll take care of that um, off camera. Okay. So, um, so there is 13 A, B, C, and D. Those are just reports. We'll move on then to discussion and action. Agenda item 14, uh, board review and possible action concerning the quarterly summary of the Texas State Board of Social Work Examiners Jurisprudence Exam Vendor. Now, I know that information is in your packet. If anybody has any questions or information about the JP exam, uh, as as indicated, stated, it's been updated 
Um, it, it is part of the requirement for, for licensure. Um, and I am right, it's a, it's a one-time thing unless you are ordered for some sort of sanction process. You take the JP exam, you don't have to take it again, but do you take it between licensure event? Like if I moved MSW, LMSW to LCSW, I would retake the, lot, the, the JP exam. But just renewal processing, you don't. It's not required, it's not required. but you can get credit for ethics hours yes, if you take it. If you take it, yeah. But it is not a requirement for renewal of licensure. It's a requirement for a license, license. a change in status. Okay. All right. So any 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 discussion uh, further about the JP exam? Um, you you've been notified that the uh, changes were made. It's all updated. It's working. Um, we don't have to vote or anything. We just no, move on. It's all done. So, Unless there's any questions yeah, about yeah. the report, but th they were shaking their heads. No, yeah. So, all right. 15, report from board chair concerning current challenges and accomplishments, lawsuits, inf interaction with stakeholders, state officials and staff, committee appointments and functions, workload of the board members, conferences, general information regarding the routine functioning of the board. Um, I will report that I did attend the ASWB Regulatory Education and Leadership Conference is just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, there was lots of, of information there. Um, Director Spinks was a panel member. Um, if he wants to 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 discuss any of the things that that he was a part of, but I was there for for both well for three days board member exchange and then two days of the conference. And there, there is lots of there, there were there have been lots of questions that came to me specifically about how we used to do things in Texas with the AMEC exam. So I answered all of those and, and did say that we are I am not I think we are not I know I am not um, looking at returning to the previous AMEC process. Um, but there will be discussion on all, there was lots of discussion at the conference about alternative avenues to licensure um, after an exam, after an unsuccess, unsuccessful attempt on an exam, meaning somebody takes the exam, they're not successful, what happens then in, in differing states that people can be processed for the exam? Um, that's an ongoing discussion um, that requires legislative change uh, in Texas. So it's not something that we, the board can just say, hey, this is what we wanna do now. That, that has to go up and through a different process. Um, it, it is interesting to see the differences around the United States and, and Canada and the US territories who are also part of ASWB testing. Um, how things are done. So we can take we can take information and insight. the The purpose of the conference was really about that you how do how should we use information or data to to drive decisions on what we do. And there was lots of discussion about that. and and it was very open source discussion. There was, individuals who, you know, you can, you can basically manipulate data to do what you want it to do. But when you drill down into the information, um, we, we want data that gives us relevant topical and current information about why certain groups are not successful on the exam. And that's where there is now a, uh, as, as we indicated before, there is a, a request for proposal for a study into that. So, so that's at least happening. Um, that's about all I got. Daryl, you got anything that you want to say about your short visit to New Orleans? I didn't get booed. Yeah, uh, so. that, was, that was your own fault. <laughs> but I haven't got comment cards back yet either. So maybe they okay. were just polite. <laughs> yeah, Daryl was part of a panel with um, Brian from Wisconsin. And I can't remember the California guy's name. But uh, it was a S. Steve. Uh, yeah, I think it was. But um, 
you know, they they talked about, you know, how 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 in their states and 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 in Texas, how we we are a proponent of using information to drive decisions. We don't just say, oh, that looks good, let's do that. So we we do we do look for reasons about why we do the things that we do. So that's that's my report out on that. Uh, other things, there will be a uh, ASWB meeting about this request for proposal that I'll attend in August, and then delegate assembly will be in November. Uh, uh, the next BHEC meeting, Daryl, when is that? May 23rd. Oh, Sarah knows, May 23rd. Okay. So we'll have that one. Um, and I think, Daryl, if I'm not going to be able to attend that, I'll, I'll, I will be in Costa Rica that day. So we will, I, I don't, I guess it just matters to quorum, but yeah. if so, we can figure that out later. So, all right. So that's all I have on 15. So now we have agenda item 16, report from the board's delegates to the uh, Texas Behavioral Health Exchange Council regarding activities of the executive council. And uh, I guess we just indicated that that's the next meeting. Uh, will be the 23rd, but first we have A, the council's rulemaking actions taking on, taken on its October 25th, 22 meeting. So I know one of the things that, that we did there, and, and then Daryl, I'll turn it over to you. I, we, we, went from, we went from four meetings to three. Is that what we did at the October meeting? That's the correct that's the wrong date on the agenda. It's the January 31st meeting. Oh, I think so. That's a long time ago. Yeah, I'm not apologize. <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. So January 31st is when we did all that. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else you want to talk about there? Council updates, Daryl? No, no. I think everything's rocking along smooth. I mean, okay. Um, you have you testified? Been to this? Been been over and talked about money and life? way more. Well, I, I will say this: it has been busier this session than it has been in the past probably two se since we underwent all, went under all underwent sunset. Uh, I've been over there quite a bit this session. A lot of mental health bills, um, lots of phone calls with uh, elected officials and their staff discussing how bills are going to impact us, how that'll work, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, right now, literally everything is still up in the air. Although we are in the the, the home stretch, this thing ends on May 29th session does so uh, we're definitely in the home stretch you're going to start to see bills uh, begin to die here probably beginning next week uh, i think next week is the deadline for them to have to clear house committee uh, if it's over in the house it's got to clear the committees by tuesday i believe or otherwise it's dead it didn't make it and then there are some deadlines beyond that for what they call second and third reading um, so it, it's about to get it's already a little feisty, but it's about to get even feistier over there. So, okay. uh, but. any any major any major bills that you wanted to take a minute to tell us about, or the uh, the there's a couple of bigger ones that that impact y'all that that are not in a negative way. I don't think uh, House Bill 1167 and House Bill 4075, both of them are by Representative Romero. Um, one basically one of them says if you're coming in if you're licensed in another jurisdiction um i think it's 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 a licensure by endorsement rule i can't remember the details now but basically if you've been licensed in another jurisdiction for one year i believe then you're eligible for a license here so that that's a big that's a big deal um and then there's also in that in one of those same bills uh, they're going to give give us uh, reciprocity authority. In other words, we can now seek reciprocity with other jurisdictions for y'all. Right now, Psych is the only one that has that authority. And so I worked with the bill author and the stakeholders and said, I would really like to have that for everybody. I'm like, I'd rather have it and another state just tell me no than to not be able to ask it all. So that's it's in there. Uh, and so hopefully keeping our fingers crossed that that one will cross the finish line. But, uh, but Daryl, that's not lining us up with the compact. No, no. The compact is a different animal. Yes. Okay. Uh, altogether. So uh, the compact, there's, there was just no way to get it uh, in ASW would have had to have get gotten it into, you know, in this session, it was just way too short of a fuse for anybody to do anything with it. So okay. um, 
hopefully we'll see something about it in the 89th, but I think a lot of that will depend upon how this, uh, this issue with the exam goes. Um, okay. Cause I know, uh, NASW will have to be the one to care. Typically the, the locals, the state association is the one that carries the water on compacts. They have to find the bill, get a sponsor for it and push it through. Cause we can't lobby. Sure. Yeah. And, DOD can reach out on their own. I know DOD is pushing all of these compacts uh, heavily because they ne they need them done. Their their folks are getting hung up. Uh, it's causing significant consternation and problems at the Department of Defense. Uh, the varying licensure requirements across the country, and they need they need a resolution to that. And this is probably the best way to do it. So they're going to be pushing hard. And I know uh, hearing some of the folks at ASWB conference talk, but some, some states are already compact driven state or compact accepted. I don't know what word it is. They've approved. But, yeah, they, they've got uh, a lot of states before the compact was even published. They filed placeholder bills. Yeah. Uh, that just said, hey, we don't know what it says yet, but we're going to go ahead and file this bill and we'll plug in the text whenever it gets here. And so those folks were definitely uh you know ahead of the ahead of the curve there ahead of the game but um i don't think anybody's passed it yet or if they have i haven't heard about it but there's a lot of people where it is moving through the process in those states so is that the blue ones is pending so so nobody's enacted yet so those light blue ones that you see on your screen um pending legislation they are pending their legislative uh process to approve it now, I, I, I will tell you all, once you start to see this thing go, I think it's going to go quick. Uh, you only have to have seven states to activate the compact. I think you all are going to hit that probably this. By this time next year, I bet the compact is live and breathing. Uh, there's there's seven, seven pendings right now. So, yeah, I mean, LPC shot off like a rocket. Uh, and I think you all are going to do the same thing. So yeah. um, I, I suspect much like the LPC compact, y'all are probably going to have some bigger money behind y'all's. Uh, a lot of the hospital and insurance uh, providers are probably going to be pushing because y'all are so embedded in those big institutions mm -hmm. that I, I suspect they're going to push for. It's nice to have those deep pockets behind you is what I'm trying to say. Because yeah. they're going to they're gonna be able to push hard. Okay. Good deal. All right, Daryl. Anything else? That's it. All right. Well, that takes care of agenda item 16. Um, Daryl, at the, um, at the MFT meeting the other week, you talked about CE broker. Do you want to? Refresh my memory, Sarah. I'm old and I've forgotten what I said. Um, uh, that you had sent a survey out to other executive directors about CE broker and about oh, yeah. Or yeah. that kind of um, type of service, if not that exactly vendor. Yeah, yeah. The at the last council meeting we were talking about, um, you know, we're looking at moving to like CE Broker or something similar to that to help manage, you know, renewals and audits and that kind of thing, kind of further automate stuff. And one of the things the council asked me to do is they said, why don't you what you know, why don't you reach out to some customers of CE Broker? Let's get some first hand reports. So I've done that. I've I've called three or four EDs. Uh well, Brian, who uh Chair Brumley, Brian, the guy I sat on the panel with there in New Orleans, he was one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked to him about CE Broker. They use it in Ohio, and he's a he's a multi. They're an umbrella board, kind of like what BHEC is. Um, I've talked with uh, the Louisiana Medical Board Director. They use it. Um, dang, who was the other person I talked to? I've talked to I think two others, and then I also just crafted a. Um, a Microsoft form survey and I had Sarah and Christina and Diane send it out to each of their respective the listserv for each of their respective association association of regulatory boards like ASWB, ASPPB for psych, AMFTRB for marriage and family therapy and so on. And so we've been getting uh, survey results back from them. Uh, I haven't heard anything bad about any of the programs. I mean, some of them don't use CE Broker. The vast majority do use CE Broker, it seems like, but uh, I haven't heard anything bad. What you, what I, something I hadn't anticipated that I have seen is the larger jurisdictions love it because it, it automates and it makes managing large volumes of data and information very easy. 
the smaller jurisdictions, they don't have anything bad to say about it. But uh, what they basically told me is, look, we're so small that we could just do this by hand just as easy. So there's not really, you know, a, an economy of scale benefit for them, but they didn't have anything bad to say about it. So I, I've been pretty pleased that I haven't heard uh, an ugly word out, out, you know, about them from anybody. It's just for some people it, it's, you know, it rocks. And for others, it's like, well, you know, it's, doesn't hurt us, but it's not really that big of an efficiency gain for us either. Yeah. Uh, I talked, Daryl, I also talked with Ohio Brian a little bit and they, um, I was concerned about, you know, cost and things like that, but there, there is no cost unless you choose to use the extended features of CE Broker. So as an, as an individual, if you just want to keep up with your CEs and submit them through that, there's no direct cost to you. But there are, there are pieces of that program if you want to buy up into the higher levels of it to do other things. I think they actually can provide CE training that yeah. you can buy through CE Broker and things like that. But just as a bookkeeping process, there's no cost. And, and I don't see that changing. It, it didn't look like it was a switch and bait kind of thing it, 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 or bait and switch. It was, yeah. it was, you, you get on it and, and it's yours for free if you just want to use it for what it's for. Yeah. And, you know, I had, um, I had kind of gone down the road of, um, and we'll talk about this at the council meeting when CE Broker gives a presentation, but just kind of the financial health of the company. Cause I thought, what I don't want to do is hitch my wagon to something that's about to go bankrupt. Yeah. <laughs> and then all of a sudden they have to change their, their, their business plan to where they're making all their money off the backs of y'all. Um, that does not seem to be anywhere near the case. Uh, Cause I've poked around quite a bit on, you know, how, what's your financial health look like? You know, or is, is this going to, do you foresee this ever changing those types of things? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, kind of worried about that too uh but it it seemed to it none of the, none of those fears seem to be realized or seem to be based in any kind of fact as far as i can tell all right board members anybody have any questions about ce broker all right i, w I will i remember now what i was going to say i will add one thing on the the different levels you know you got the free account which is just the basic account that gets uh -huh. it'll get the job done you, you don't have to actually buy anything to be able to comply with stuff it it uh one thing i learned i think ce broker told me that if you're ever selected for audit they automatically kick you up into the highest level of account for free so that you've got all the bells and whistles i'm i'm assuming in case you were short hours you could use their concierge service to you know to get those hours made up quickly but um one of the things that one of the eds told me he said, you know, we thought everybody would pretty much stay on the, the free account or the basic account. He said, but what we've seen is uh, more and more people migrated to that paid account because they just didn't want to fool with it. Uh, they didn't want to have to fool with trying to figure out getting stuff scheduled and, you know, all the rigmarole that goes with it. And so, um, and then especially if they were very, if they were short, you know, hours at the end of their renewal cycle, they would panic. And he said, then they would just pay the extra $50 or whatever it was to get the concierge level account. And they would get it all set up for them. And it was just, it was just taken care of. So it was like $50 or whatever it is. I don't know. It's less than hundred dollars. I know, but it's pay that money and it, they don't worry about it. They just get told here, show up at this. This is where your webinar is, or this is where it's going to be. You show up, put your butt in the seat, watch it. Uh, and then, you know, it's taken care of for them. So he, he said, they've, it's just a convenience you get you get used to that level of convenience and being catered to and uh he said he's, he's not they've noticed a lot more people migrating towards it and, and away from the free account uh, but that's just the nature of bells and whistles i suppose it will attract more people over time that's it convenience cost so all right thank you daryl we'll move forward to agenda item 17 Discussion and possible action regarding council's request that member boards review their rules for potential changes to comply with the December 22 report from the Senate Special Committee to protect all Texans. It's the Uvalde report. Yeah. So that, yeah, that stems from the, um, the Uvalde um, school shooting that happened. Um, there, there is information 
Uh, Sarah, you have anything you want to add to it? I mean, we don't. We... I'm, so the report was in the in the materials uh, for the meeting for you to review, and the council specifically was looking for. And Daryl, correct me if I'm wrong, but looking for rules that would increase entry into um, into the profession, so there'd be greater access to mental health care, or look at rules that might present. Um, a barrier that doesn't necessarily um, protect the public, per se. And maybe this is something to refer to the Rules Committee for the next meeting, or is there something that um, you want the board to take action on today, Daryl? No, I, I think probably, probably referring it to the Rules Committee would be the best thing to do. I will say that y'all have y'all have made so many significant changes in recent in recent times. For example, just the stuff you looked at today, eliminating that 48 hour and 60 month cap. Right. That's the kind of stuff that hangs people up and you can't really you have a difficult time justifying it. So that's what the council is looking for. That's what the Uvalde, the Senate and the House are looking for. They're like for God's sakes, people look at stuff and figure out what is what is needed to protect the public and then what is really geared more towards the best practices. Let's, let's get away from the best practices, go with minimum necessary for public protection, because we have got to field more providers. Um, they are they're really leaning on us to 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 we, we got to get more folks out in the field. We're I mean, I realize there's a bottleneck. We can only license as many as people as the programs can pump out. I get that. But Whatever, uh, as, as John Belimowitz and I, we went over and testified on this. Um, basically, if there's any, whatever our portion of the pie is that uh, where we are operating as a barrier, you know, where we have a barrier, we need to take ownership of that and really evaluate it to determine is it necessary or not. Uh, we can't do anything about the schools, you know, the student loan problems, that kind of thing. That's way beyond our purview, but whatever our little piece of the pie is, we need to take ownership of it and just really evaluate. And I, I mean, I think y'all are doing that. Uh, just the rule changes that you did today are a good example of that, but it, it, it doesn't ever hurt to, to throw some eyes on it again, see if there's something we missed, so. All right, thanks for that, Daryl. And, and, and if y'all, you know, board members and the, the, the information is out there and just, just so the public knows, I mean, we're licensing folks more efficiently and quickly than ever before, as far as I can tell. Ever since ever before I've been part of this board, um, I think we're we're pretty much within a thirty day window for in state licensure stuff. I know. I'm, we can look at those somewhere and I know they're in the packet, but, um, you know, I think out of state takes a little longer just because there's more to do to get from, you know, you're dealing with, you're dealing with other states. So you have to, you know, you're on their clock, but folks that graduate in Texas, apply in Texas, test in Texas, it's pretty quick now. So Sarah's, can you share that yes. screen please, ma'am? So She's going to share the screen and we, we'll just go ahead and look at those numbers now. Um, so social work, those dates represent the time it came in. Is that? That's the date that staff is working on for applications. For example, applications that were received on April 25th is what for a new license is what staff is working on and reviewing those applications. So if you submitted your application on April 26th, Staff hasn't gotten to that yet. If you submitted it on April 24th or 23rd, it's likely that you have already received a deficiency notice either by letter or by email. Um, be sure to check your junk and spam folders. We often send emails through a do not reply account and sometimes uh, the recipient's uh, email filters that into a junk or spam email, so check on that. If, if you're applying from out of state, staff is working on those that were received February 27th, et cetera, across the board. A little bit further down on this page, which is the uh, applications and timelines page, um, is a 
is a chart that shows our minimum, maximum, median, and average timeframes for each license type. So from fiscal year 2022. So if you need to kind of get a judge for how long it might take for your particular application to be reviewed, you might look at the average or the median times just for planning purposes. And, and guys, those, those maximum times that you see there, those tend to, I mean, I think people get scared when they see those numbers, but those are folk that those are ones that are, uh, I mean, I don't think there's that many of them. It's a low number, but those are ones that there, there's an issue that has to be dealt with before, an, before a license is either approved or denied. And, and that just requires communication between the uh, licensure applicant and the board and, and our, our staff at the board. So uh, don't let those numbers scare you. Look at those other numbers there that, you know, the median time is, you know, 30 for us, for social work, it's, you know, 37 days or 28 days. And then the average is, is, you know, a little, so within, we're, you know, we're well within, we're well within a two month window, but those numbers have to include those maximums. So that pulls, pulls a number up. Um, if you pull those maximums out of there, our numbers would be significantly lower. So time frames have improved drastically over the past two, three, four years. So, all right. Thank you for that. Um, all right. Is there any, um, so, so we were really talking about 17 and that sort of led us down that rabbit trail, but um, any, any other discussion or questions about agenda item 17, the protect our Texans act? Um, all right, hearing none, we will move to agenda item 18, uh, per Title III of the Texas Occupations Code, Section 505-108 and 22 TAC 781-202, discussion of possible action regarding proposal to switch from quarterly to triannual meetings, three meetings a year, followed by discussion and possible action concerning proposed meeting dates for the 24-25 biennium. So, that was one of the things that um, was discussed and BHEC, the, the, the umbrella board, BHEC did approve moving to a three meeting a year cycle. Um, I'd just like to hear input from y'all about what y'all think. Three, three versus four meetings, um, just depending on the, the timeliness and the efficiency uh, of the meetings. You know, can can we do it in three meetings a year, or does having that extra meeting in a year allow us to be more efficient? What what do y'all what do y'all say? I have not been here long enough to speak on it. I'd have to hear from people that have been here longer, but I think well, the more meetings, the more we can address. Okay. Ben, you got anything? You've been here as long as I have. What do you think about three versus four? Is there precedent for the three meetings or any of the other boards doing that? Uh, do we have any feedback from, from other areas? Daryl, you want to take, or the, Sarah? The LPC board has agreed to three meetings per year, and I believe the psychologist board has agreed to three meetings per year. The MFT board has chosen to stick with quarterly meetings. Hmm. Let me uh, let, let me let me add one thing. Kind of when I approached BHEC about this, really what I had in mind was I, I really ultimately I I would have liked I would have preferred that the member boards drop to three and that BHEC stay at four, just so that we could it would be easier to handle everything because everything has to go through BHEC. But I mean, here we are sitting at what y'all start at eight thirty this morning. Yeah. An hour and a half later, you're almost done with your agenda. Uh, and outside those rules and a couple of applicants who were, you had no discretion anyway, right. you, you really haven't had to tackle uh, any big issues. And I've noticed that y'all are one of my quicker boards. Uh, and I'm not saying that as that's actually a kudos and kind of a, an applause to you guys. I mean, y'all are knocking it out of the park very quick whenever y'all get into your meetings. Um, you're, not, you're not wasting a lot of time. You're getting, you're getting business handled and then you're going on with your day. I don't, I just don't, 
see why you could not tackle the amount of work that we have on these agendas in three meetings a year versus four. Now, to play the devil's advocate to that, the, you know, it would applicants maybe have to wait, you know, an extra 30 days to hear from you? Yes, uh, that, that's the one downside to moving to the triannual meetings. Uh, but again, like today's applicants, there's no discretion. So, you know, does the 30 days, is that really that important for those particular applicants? No, I don't think it is uh, because there was that, that end is a foregone conclusion anyway. The law is very clear on those two. Um, I just don't see, with the way things are running as efficient as everything is clicking along here, I just don't see the need to meet four, four times a year. That having been said, you would always have the option to call a meeting uh, if you wanted it. That's, that's why I'm like, it's a no harm, no foul deal if you move to three and you realize, oh crud, this applicant, we really need to get her taken care of, or we got some big big ticket item that's popped up. Okay, well then Rumley yeah. just calls the meeting and we do it. Um, I mean, it's, it really is that simple. There's no magic to it. So I, I just don't see a lot, I, to me, it's a low risk proposition. And I, I think the one legitimate argument is, well, uh, you know, an applicant might have to wait uh, 30 days, uh, another 30 days, or I mean, it might be longer than that, but an applicant might have to wait a little bit longer, but that's the only legitimate argument that I can see. And, and Daryl or Patrick, in, in, in the event that, that Sarah or staff or whoever, you know, they reach out to me and or, or whoever they need to reach out to, and they say, we have this situation that we need to address and and it comes a month after this meeting so we're here in may so let's say early june we have a we have some high profile thing that we have to deal with do we then does it require a time frame to set a meeting 30 days out? i mean what what's the process no. for doing okay. a called meeting it's like literally like we can have y'all in in nine days uh nine that's days. Okay. yeah from the date we post that agenda there has to be, there has to be seven days elapsed between the date of posting and the date of the meeting. So really, we we say nine days just to cover our rear ends on that. But so no, the, I mean, if it's just a true emergency, now that that's a statutorily defined thing. If it's a true emergency, we can meet just like that. Okay. But for an applicant type issue, it would be nine days. Um, so we can get you in pretty quick. Now I, I will tell you this because the way we do committees now, the chances yeah. of you have an emergency where you need to call the full, full board in for like an applicant uh, ought to be, ought to be slim to none. Yeah. We haven't because, done that a long time. Yeah. The committees ought to be able to handle most of this stuff and make these decisions. The yeah. only time, the only time you're going to have to really come to the board with like an applicant issue is if the committee has said, no, we're not going to do it. Then they can appeal that to the board but at that point, I'm not as much worried about the passage of time there because we've already had several of you on the board look at it. And we know that staff that, so we've had staff probably come down in one way and then the committee probably came down in that same way. And now we're just waiting on the board to more than likely confirm what we, you know, what we've already kind of arrived at. Uh, so I, I, to me, it's just kind of a low risk proposition here. And the and, decision is y'all's to make. You you can stay at four if you want to. I just and would it be relevant to consider that if we move from four to three, we would have a little more to do at the three. Yeah. But by the by the way we're moving through these meetings and 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 I appreciate girls' comments. I I hate meetings. <laughs> so <laughs> that's why as a as a meeting leader. I am all about let's do the agenda, let's move through it, let's discuss all you want to discuss, but we're not going off on all these tangents. We're gonna we're gonna stick to it and get through it. So um, I don't I don't mind and, and and I enjoy I enjoy getting to see y'all. I enjoy getting to hear from the public, all those kind of things. And I don't want to cut that down if there's a reason that we need to do it. But if there's not a reason to have four meetings, if we if we have the option to to be a little more concise in our time and our processing, we may have a little bit longer three meetings, but we also have the ability to call a meeting if we need is what I'm understanding. And that's not a huge 
ordeal. It's not going it, to, it wouldn't extend somebody all the way out to 30, 60 days. We could, we could actually do it within 10 to 14 days, probably. So, all right. So on agenda item number 18, um, I think I'm Ms. Unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you want to say something, Audrey? Um, do we have the ability to try it for a couple of meetings and then if it doesn't work, go back to the four or not? Oh yeah, that that's an internal decision that that we we would make, Audrey. So we could we could list them on here and give it a year or give it a three meeting cycle and see. I mean, we got to give it enough time to see what works and what doesn't work. So right. I would say at least a at least a three meeting year, and um, go forward from that, and and then reset it as an agenda item for discussion and possible action at a future point. Is that sort of what you're asking? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Ben, Dolores, Katie. So we oh, would still have. have oh, sorry. That's okay. Katie, so I'll we let would you go. Would we still have the option of um, Zoom meetings or would it change to be, have to be in person or? At, at this point, um, we're still looking at Zoom meetings. My understanding is that the conference rooms that are here in our new building aren't ready yet. And I don't Correct. know when they will be ready. So at this point, we're, we're looking at continuing the Zoom meetings. Okay. I'll tell you Ms. Andrade, uh, even once the con even after the conference rooms are ready and they give us the green light that we can start using them, my intent is, assuming it's okay with all the board chairs, my intent is to still maintain a hybrid style meeting for those of you that want to zoom in. We, we've got we need to keep using the Zoom system because of the public participation. And honestly, it is a gigantic pain in the rear to get to this building here in the Capitol Complex. And I don't want the public having to traipse. There's no place to park for the public. You can mm -hmm. ask Chair Brumley. We make him park over in a separate garage and hike over here. And so there's really no place to park. So it's, there's not a good option for the public to attend an in-person meeting. I want to be able to keep it where people can just zoom in. And if we're going to do that, we might as well keep it to where if you need to be in the office, you can just zoom in too. Um, that's it's not really that big of a deal. This is what this has become second nature to us now. So, um, and I, these new rooms we have, they're supposed to be set up to where we can do hybrid style meetings where if you need to zoom in, you can. If Ben and Audrey want to be here, fine. They can sit around the table and everybody will still be able to see and hear one another. And then the public will still be able to watch like they've been doing. So, okay, thank you. All right. So does so this is this is an agenda item that we would need to uh, possibly take action on. Does anybody want to? Um, I, I would entertain a motion. Well, I make a motion that we move forward with a uh, triannual meeting schedule. Okay. Now, I second. Thank, thank you, Ben and Katie. Uh, so, point of order and discussion here. If we adopt this today, it goes into effect in 24, 25. Okay. Is that correct? Am I am I saying that right? Yes. Okay. So, so, be so our, fiscal year 24, the first meeting would be after September 1 of 2023. Three, yes. Okay. So, that so we still there's still one more meeting for us this this this, term, fiscal, year. this fiscal year okay so this would go into effect so we would have a we would we we could potentially well she's got a schedule she can show us can you put that up there okay. uh, Sarah just so that everybody is clear to what it looks like so so if we look on the right side uh, of the column there so. 24. So September 1 is the fiscal year for the state of Texas. So after September 1, so October 6. Um, so we would have an, an October, a January, a May. And so it would really, or we could even spread those out more if we wanted to, because then, then it would be from May to October before we would physically have another meeting. So we can play around with the schedule. This is just a proposed uh, 
plan that we could look at. So, but we're still, we still have a meeting before September 1st in this fiscal year. So um, we can play around with those numbers, but we do have a, a motion and a second uh, to accept the three meeting a year plan. So all those in favor, please indicate by raising your hand. Motion does carry uh, unanimously. So we will move to a three meeting a year program with the caveat that any called meetings um, by voting yes, y'all have agreed that if we have a called meeting, you will attend. So uh, <laughs> I don't think I can hold you to that, but you're here now, so I can say that. All right, so that's 18. Um, agenda item 19 is report from board administrator concerning operations, organization, staffing, workload, processing, statistical information, status of rulemaking, customer service, inquiries, challenges, media, legislative and stakeholder contacts and concerns, special projects and general information concerning or regarding the routine functioning of the program. So that's you, Sarah. Thank you. So that's a lot. So um, staff has asked me to uh, remind people that are applying for licensed clinical social worker or applying to reclassify their master's as a licensed clinical social worker that there are three elements to uh, achieving that, that they have to have been under clinical supervision for at least 24 months, um, accruing the 3,000 hours with the 100 hours of supervision. We've had a lot of deficiency notices where someone's had 4,000 hours, but they've only got 23 months or some other element is one of the three is missing. So um, please pay attention to that. If you are a master social worker or if you are the supervisor of someone pursuing um, clinical supervised experience, make sure that all three of those elements are satisfied before they apply for the reclassification. Also wanted, I think I mentioned earlier that um, Staff does send emails from a do not reply account. And sometimes the filter of the recipient's emails uh, system sends that res response to the junk or the spam folder. So I ask everyone, if you're expecting a, a reply from council staff um, or from social work board staff, then please check your junk and your spam folders before you send in a second or third email asking the same question. So I just wanted to ask you to check on that. Um, Sarah, just for my clarification, are deficiency notices sent both ways, regular mail and email or just? If the licensee the has provided an email address in their application, uh -huh. staff will reach out to the email address first. Just again, we're trying to streamline and do things in a quicker, easier fashion, just for ourselves, as well as for the applicant and the licensees. So we will try to reach out by email first, if the licensee has provided an email, and if that licensee's email is up to date. Sometimes they've changed emails and they've uh, not uh, gone on our online system and updated their email address. So we'll try the email first, and then if we need be, we will send a letter. Okay. So with the letter comes subsequent to an email if that's provided. And we don't always reach out. If we're successful with email, we wouldn't reach out with a, a letter. With a letter. Okay. So we're trying to, again, trying to keep things um, as, as streamlined as possible. I wanted to let you know about a couple of new uh, web pages on the website. This is our homepage at www.bhac.texas.gov. And on the quick links on the right-hand side is a new proposed rule changes and rulemaking process webpage. Um, this, this has been um, very well received and very much appreciated. It summarizes the rulemaking process and then also lists the rules that are open for public comment. Um, it separates them by those that are in chapters 881 to 885. We colloquially call them the council rules, but they apply to all four member boards. So, 
as a social worker licensee or applicant or say a stakeholder in the social worker processes, you want to pay attention to the ones that are listed under the behavioral council. And then you also want to slide down and pay attention to those that are listed under the social work board. None at this time, so come back at a later date. Um, and then also there's a convenient way to, to submit a public comment on a particular section of the rule. If you have a comment on two different sections like 88210 and 88410, you'll need to separate, you'll need to send in two separate public comments. This is going to streamline things. Uh, we hope it's, hopefully it simplifies things for those that want to make comment and I, I hope it increases stakeholder engagement, but it also streamlines things for staff and streamlines it for the board's review and for the council's review because they're looking at just one chunk of public comment for that particular section as they review it. Back to our homepage, if you scroll down so you can see the quick links again, um, there's the workforce survey data. If you haven't completed the survey, it's open until December 31st. Please go ahead and complete the survey. If you already have, or if you're just interested, there's some live data that you can click on and explore what's been entered in the survey so far. So I'd like to encourage you to everyone to complete the survey so we have the most complete and accurate data from which to make more evidence-based decisions. Let me check my notes on. And I, I will tell the public, I have already been using that data in my conversation with legislators. Uh, and so I really, I just, I can't emphasize enough the importance of everybody taking that survey. And it'll be an ongoing thing. Every year we'll, we'll start it over again because I want a fresh snapshot Maybe every every year, may, at least at least every biennium, every two years, we'll do it. But uh, just it'll be an ongoing thing. So I need everybody to stay engaged and and participating in that thing because it is incredibly helpful uh, when I, when I go over the legislature when the when elected officials need to know what's the student loan debt your folks are looking at. I, well, okay, I can tell you now. Um, <laughs> Is that what? What are some of the primary things that legislators are asking for that that you have in that data? Who takes insurance? Who takes Medicaid? What percentage of the patients are uh, actually come in with insurance? Uh, those are those are probably the biggest things that I've seen. Okay. And then uh, where are they? Where are they serving? Is it in the urban areas? Uh, there, there was kind of a what this survey has shown. And I'll shut up. But it's a rural is is on the tail end of services receiving services by far and away urban's not much better though and then suburban is like just a, everybody's delivering services there uh that's that's what's getting the lion's share of the cake and then those of us in rural texas and those of you in urban texas we're getting kind of the crumbs okay and that's that's important based on what you said earlier about some of the decisions about you know, uh, allowing, I think it was a site board to do CEs in underserved areas, you know, yep. I mean, anything that we, anything that we can do as a board to promote um, mental health services in underserved or underpopulated areas of Texas is, is an important thing. So it's good that we now that, because I mean, two years ago, we, you didn't have that data. You couldn't answer that question. So um, now you're more data driven. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a voluntary process. Um, we're not, I mean, we don't collect that on your renewal data. So this process is, is important for everybody to take part in. There is a, there is a survey that's done by health professions council. Is that right? That's, that goes through our database. So that does get collected, but yeah, the, the, the data minimum data set as we need it. That's correct. Right. The minimum data set, but it's weird we collect it but we don't have access to it uh and the the one time i was able to get my hands on it it's just this big wad of gobbledygook that you can't make heads or tails of it, it's in a format that is of no use to a guy like me i i can't i can't use it so um and, it, and it's not nearly as detailed as like what we're doing in our workforce survey it's it's more like what's your highest degree where did you go to school where's your practice at it doesn't dig down into, you know, what's your salary? How many people do you treat per per week? Uh, how many direct hours do you provide to patients versus indirect? That's the kind of stuff that's more useful to us on the regulatory and the legislative side. 
Yeah, and that, and, and I want the public to understand this is this is a pathway that allows everybody that, that is a licensed social worker in Texas to have input into what they are doing that we can then encapsulate and give to the to the the lawmakers so that they can make decisions based on real time data. So it, it is an important process and I encourage any and everybody to go on there and complete that survey. So go to the home page and then scroll down to the workforce survey data and uh, launch it here in the in the uh, with the launch button. And it's it's no no more than 10, 10 to 15 minutes of your time to to fill that out. I mean you, you don't have to go look up stuff. You you just answer the questions. So and one more a uh, couple other things I'd like to announce. Um, for everyone please go check to click on verify license or online search. This is the publicly available information about your license. Click on here to launch the portal and check the status of your license. Um, we've, we've completed the first segment of getting everyone who holds a license fingerprinted that weren't fingerprinted necessarily when their license was issued, but had to do it for their renewal process. Um, and, and we've discovered that many people believed that they paid their fee and they were done with renewal, but please know that staff cannot renew the license until that fingerprint process was done. So if even if you think that your license is an active status, please double check. And if your license is delinquent or heaven forbid, if it's expired, contact us so that we can get that um, straightened out and get that get you back into an active status. So I encourage you to go and, and look at that. Um, my other comments were regarding the compact, which we've already talked about. And I think that's the end. So on that, that, that Sarah brought up a point that, that yeah, I want to make. It. I don't know about other board members, but I get, I get emails. I don't get phone calls much, but I do get emails all the time from um, the public asking me a question and if it's something I know um, that I don't have to guess about I will answer that question otherwise I send it up to Sarah and Tim here but one of the things that that I've become proficient with is going to our website and using what's there. Um, there there's lots of information out there guys and if you go somewhere over here Sarah there's something that talks about forms and uh, forms right there, forms and publications. So at first you'd want to go. Yeah, to, go to your right board. Go to click on the social workers board and that takes you to a specific yeah. page. And these quick links change a little bit for each of the member boards. So the forms and publications yes. under the social work heading is a little bit different than the forms and publications under the council. Yeah, but there's, I mean, if you got a question about being a supervisor, a clinical supervisor, there's, there's links right there that take you directly to it. If you've got questions about um, somewhere in there, recently I've had four or five folks whose license have expired, meaning they've been delinquent for at least a year or more and they want to become reinstated. Well, there's a, there's, a, there's a page, there's a link on here that takes you to a form that tells you here are all the steps you have to do to, to start that process. So there's, um, and, and I know Tim put up here, there's the fingerprint information is there. If you want to know, you know I, I got to get fingerprinted, how do I do it? Or I've already been fingerprinted, can I use it? Well, probably not, but <laughs> here's here's why. And here's where you go to do it at. So a lot of time, if you will spend five minutes looking and using this and familiar side, familiarize yourself with this website, there is an abundant of abundance of information here. Also, there's a lot of um, kind of self-serve type of features that uh, the council has you do um, to update your address, to update your email, to renew your license. All of that is done online. Um, and there's under the how to user guides, there's all kinds of things, how to change your name, how to update your address. I need a, I need a new, wall certificate. I didn't get a 
renewal permit because staff doesn't mail them anymore. Um, so if you need a re renewal permit, rather than looking on the online verification or having your employer look on the online verification, here's how you request one. All of those kinds of things are there and they're explained in a step-by-step -step basis with screen captures to help you out. My final uh, item for my report is I have a number of inquiries from, a, um, from uh, master social workers who uh, wish to do telehealth and may not wish to stay in Texas. So they might, because their family's moving to Louisiana or New Mexico, they wanna continue doing their clinical supervision via telehealth um, while they are physically not in Texas. And I want to reiterate that your Texas license only authorizes you to practice while you are physically in Texas and to a client who is physically in Texas at the time the services are received. Same goes for a supervisor. If your associate is not in Texas, then your license, your Texas license does not allow you to provide supervision to that associate who is now in New Mexico. So be careful. That doesn't mean that they can't proceed with their career. It just means that if you're looking only to the Texas license, for them to provide services while they're in New Mexico or for them to provide services to someone who's in, a client who's in New Mexico, you need to be looking at another jurisdiction's laws and rules as well as Texas laws and rules. And if you're confused by that, you might need to consider consulting with um, a legal professional who can help you with the jurisdictional issues. So I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, um, I'm getting a volume of uh, inquiries in that regard, and I just want to help spread the word so that down the road, these, these um, master social workers and these supervisors don't get into some kind of uh, bind or get into some kind of trouble. Ms. Science Davila, you have your hand raised. Yes, I wanted to ask uh, Chair Brumley if we could put uh, a question for the Rules Committee regarding sure. the telehealth. So I'll refer the matter to the Rules Committee. We do have a number of frequently asked questions on the website to help people um, look at their particular scenario, um, but I can refer it to the Rules Committee as well. And we have Thank four you. members who are on video, but we're not voting. Can we continue? Attorney Patrick or Daryl? No, so we wanna take a minute, a few minute break? Yeah, we got two. Okay. okay. So um, we will take a break. It is, what time do you have, Sarah? 10.30? 10.38. 10 10.38, okay. So we will take a break at 10.38. Um, let's just take five minutes and we'll come right back. Sarah's going to post a notice here. Man, they all just left. Thank you. We have four board members back. Five, so we have a five, quorum. I'm, I'm sorry, five. Yes. So we have a quorum and an attorney, and we're good to resume. Okay. So we were hearing a report out from uh, agenda item 19 from uh, board administrator Sarah. Any any anything else? Oh, we were we were taught. Dolores had asked that we add to the rulemaking, and y'all are going to Sarah can communicate with you, Dolores, about the specific information you want to be quest or, or discussed in that rule yes. process, and we will we will take care of that in a rules committee meeting. Thank you. And uh, then deal with uh, that in a future meeting. So, all right. So now we're on to a, anything else, Sarah, before I move on? No, I'm okay. done. Thank you. So agenda item 20, discussion and possible action regarding future priorities and activities of the board. Um, so we, we do have some... Uh, so the field instructor CE thing, we're going to, we are referring it to rules. Uh, Dolores has another uh, input for a future rules committee. Um, I want to, I want to add, and, and Dolores, this is kind of along what we were just talking about. I had my first inquiry and I had to come to Sarah and Tim to, to get an answer, had a, 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 an applicant reach out. They have a client who is going to, and use summer as a verb, 
They're going to summer in Spain. The client is. They're going to be gone to Spain for three months, but they want to continue receiving clinical services from a Texas provider. So not only is it things we have to address now with, with, with these telehealth capabilities, um, from state to state, we've got international stuff that we're having to consider. Um, it doesn't yes. change. The, it doesn't change the rule for for us because our rule is fairly clear that right. you know you you have to be in Texas and licensed. But you know I have no idea what's you know how you would coordinate with some Spanish or Spain. I, I don't know. I, we just told right. them no, you can't do it according to the current rules. So right. that's that's where we are with that. Um, so other than other than that, one of the other things that that I'm seeing are, are getting questions about, and I don't I don't I'm just going to do it in layman's terms as I understand it. We have people who are LMSW, so they're not clinical, who open a practice and want to contract with LCSWs to work in this practice but the LMSW owns the practice. And that's, that's a quirky thing, but I mean, I know we have, we have rules around it, um, but that's something that I think people are getting confused about. So um, Sarah, do you have that? Yeah, let me get it up. She's, she's gonna pull that, that up. Patrick, do you have any insight as to, as to that process? Well, I think I think there's a specific rule that says you can't employ your supervisor. You can't be the employer, or uh, so it, it, an LMSW could own a business, but they wouldn't if their super if their supervisor is their is their W two employee. That I don't think that 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 the rules would allow that because um, the supervisor isn't supposed to then be. You know, the supervisee isn't supposed to be able to have, you know, basically power right. over the yeah. supervisor by, oh, well, I'm not going to pay you this month if you're not going to, you know, let me do this or that. So, right. But, but if they're not, so, so, the, but if, if the LMSW is not under supervision, they just want to open, I'm LMSW. If I want to open Brian's, Brian's counseling service and I want to hire Dolores to work for me under contract, there's not a rule that inhibits me from doing that. Is that correct? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. the the uh, The other part of that question though would be the LMSW would need to have independent practice recognition. I think right in order to not to be basically be self employed, right, working hanging their own shingle, so they're running their own business. But if they're employing other, uh, they're owning a business and they're employing other mental health professionals. I don't think there's a specific rule, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, that would prohibit that. I, I think it's I, I think it's a little more nuanced. In uh, 781.301, the ones I have highlighted here, it talks about, for example, an LMSW who is not an independent practice, uh, is not recognized for independent practice, um, cannot provide direct social work services to a client from a location that he or she uh, owns or leases. So um, that's that seems prohibitive. So it depends on what they're doing. So if they're not, and, but and they can't not, yeah. in 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 subsection I, it says that they cannot bill directly or to third parties. So how they are running a business without running afoul of these two provisions i i can't imagine but right they would but need it, an ipr it's possible, i guess yeah I, I would say they would need an ipr to to do it i'm not saying they can do it without an ipr oh i, I see yeah and and to just to verify for people who may not be as familiar with the independent practice recognition it is non-clinical social work only so if you are recognized for independent practice and you open your own business, it's only to provide non-clinical social work services. 
this so is, it gets it gets a sticky wicket yeah it it, it gets a that, that's kind of where the confusion is coming in and i don't know if that's something that rules should look at to clean that language up in with support from the attorneys i, I don't know how that works daryl patrick y'all have any insight here i think this well, has come up in before and i believe that we asked the board to allow the attorneys to look at it during the four-year rule review okay because i just went to three different sections and there's probably in definitions a, a fourth or fifth section that you might want to look at and some of the social worker rules are they were organized a little bit um, differently. So like all, all the supervision is under maybe under one section, both for clinical and for non-clinical independent practice, because it was all supervision. But it might be a little easier to understand if, for example, those were split into two different sections. Yeah. And I believe that the social work board um, agreed that we might wait for that four year rule review, which might include some reorganization, which would make it easier to understand. Okay. That, I, know, I know we're getting, we're getting a lot of scope of yeah. practice type of questions, but I, I think a four-year rule review that allows for uh, the, the attorneys to truly study it would be of benefit rather than a piecemeal, fix it here, fix it there. Okay. Does that sound fair to y'all, Patrick, being the attorneys? Uh, yeah, I think that that was something that we had we had discussed is that the in the rule review we're really going to need to um, probably tr try to make things more streamlined and that will hopefully uh, I agree with what what Sarah what Sarah's talking about is okay. that um, that way you when you have a question you look at one rule as opposed to four or three three rules so right okay all right well that's um, any any board members, anybody else have anything that they want to be considered for agenda item 20 discussion and possible action for future meetings? All right, seeing no hands, no discussion, we will move on to agenda item 21, which is public comment. I'll turn it over to Sarah and just say public, if you would please use the raise hand function within Zoom so that we know you want to speak. Um, she will call on you and I believe you have about um, three minutes. Patrick, are you gonna be our timekeeper? Okay, okay. he's, he's say, shaking his head, yes. So, gen so generally, sorry. So generally we take people who are here in person as public commenters first. We have no one here in person. We then look to those who are attending by computer and ask that they use the raise hand feature as Chair Bromley just mentioned. And as we go through uh, those who are attending by computer and they have an opportunity to speak, we will then turn to anyone who is attending by telephone. Um, when, you, when you are asked to speak, please identify yourself and also identify whether you are speaking on behalf of just yourself or if you are speaking on behalf of an organization. Please know that the public comment uh, portion of the agenda is not uh, to have a back and forth discussion with the board. Um, and also please refrain from asking about a particular application or a particular complaint. Um, staff will be happy to help you with a particular application or a particular complaint. Use the contact us uh, feature on our webpage to uh, submit that. And with that said, I will go to the attendees. I see two hands raised. Elizabeth Westbrook, you have comment? I do. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so my name is Elizabeth Westbrook. I'm here just on behalf of myself. And so I've been working with Will Francis, who I believe sent this information over to Brian a few weeks ago. And so um, I'm going to be speaking about Texas Family Code 153.6101 about the qualifications of a family facilitator, if that's helpful for y'all. So I have been an LBSW since 2021 and completed my 88 hours of required facilitation training in 2022. The requirements for a facilitator are laid out in Texas Family Code, as I previously stated, 
And I meet the qualifications under section 153.6101 subsection B. A few months ago, I received a letter of concern from BHEC based off of a screenshot of my LinkedIn profile that referenced both my designation as a licensed social worker, as well as a facilitator and accused me of engaging of independent practice. This claim was not substantiated and I was not practicing outside of my bounds of certification to facilitate, nor my license as a social worker and was accruing practicum hours for graduate studies at a law firm at the time of the allegation. I was forced to retain an attorney during my semester of graduate school just to fight the egregious claims. And it's my sincere hope that the same thing does not happen to other well-intentioned professionals. I'm bringing this issue before the licensing board because the ambiguity in the administrative code does not state that an IPR status is needed to work as a parenting facilitator. I'm currently under supervision and working towards my IPR designation at the encouragement of BHEC. I would like to offer my time as a volunteer to work together with this board to change the language in this section of the code to clarify the confusing verbiage about parenting facilitation, allowing social workers to make a livable wage and to do the jobs that they are trained to do. I'm so appreciative of the work both the, the TSBSWE and BHEC does to protect the public. Um, and Daryl today, they had that outstanding. Um, just really thankful for that allyship. Um, but gray areas can lead to misinterpretation. I'd like to work alongside this board to make a slight change in the current rules to save social workers like my, me the financial hardship of providing proving their innocence when clarity and language could have easily resolved the issue. I would be more than willing to offer my time to ensure this happens quickly so even more licensed professionals can work together to keep families out of costly and adversarial litigation. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sure. Mr. Francis, you have public comment? Yes, my name is Will Francis, and I'm the executive director of NSW Texas. I just want to support what Elizabeth was saying. I, I hope the board does take up this uh, rules issue and, and looks into it. Um, I've got a couple of issues I, I want to talk about here. First off, and I'm hoping I misheard, but I thought I heard Sarah Passholt say that a licensed social worker, someone who's licensed in Texas, needs to be physically in Texas to provide services to someone in Texas. And I do not believe that is the correct interpretation of the rules. You know, plenty of people who are licensed in multiple states, Louisiana, Texas, Nevada, New York, see clients in those and are not physically located here during the time of services. So I would just maybe like some clarification on that, um, since, again, the way that we understand the rules is that the client is where uh, the license needs to be. So if you were seeing someone in New York, obviously, you'd need to be licensed there. Um, as for the data that Daryl showed up there, that was fantastic, but it really needs to be disaggregated by profession, if at all possible. It really makes it challenging when we're looking at some of those areas um, to not know which ones are social workers, which ones are psychologists. So I would love to make that recommendation. I definitely support the rules change on internships. Uh, the only thing I would add, which is similar to um, what is in the rules already, is that you receive five hours for teaching a class. And to all intents and purposes, an internship is a class. Uh, it is given a grade. Um, the, inter, uh, the intern supervisor reviews the work of the intern and then is the one who determines whether or not uh, that person passes or doesn't pass and what their numeric grade is. So since it fits in that spa same space as a class, I would, I would think that it could be looked at as one. Um, I still think that exam fees need to be looked at. Um, this board really should respond to, to what the disparities in the ASWB exam show us. And that is that multiple testing attempts have an inordinate financial burden on certain populations. And looking at having someone retake the, the exam um, at either no cost or minimal cost would make a whole lot of sense when it comes uh, to looking at equity. Um, and um, that's all my comments. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Will. Mark used to be on the board. Mark Talbot, previous board member. Yeah. You have comment? Good morning, uh, board members. Um, I just wanted to say I appreciate being able to reminisce with you this morning. And uh, I'm glad to see many of you that I worked with before. And uh, thank you for letting me join the meeting. Well, thank you, Mark, and hope things are hope things are going well down in deep South Texas. Yeah, I know there's somebody else on the board from Mac Allen, I think. So I'm I'm happy to see that we're still represented. And Ben, I'm glad to see that you're still there. And Audrey, I think you and I were on the board for a while together. And Mr. Chairman and Sarah, happy to see that you're back helping yeah. out too. But good to see you. I miss it. 
it was a great experience and you all do great work. I'm uh, proud of proud to have been a member of the board. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Mark was Mark was on the board when Ben and I came on and served served judiciously as a public member for us for a lot of years there. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, you're 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 going to three meetings. We had eight when I yeah. we had uh, four <laughs> regular meetings and then we had four rules committee meetings along yep. with that. So yeah, I was very different. I was, yeah, we were coming to Austin just just about once a month for a while there. Yeah, Trying you're right, it. just about. Yeah. It was hectic and busy. So, all right. And and from Paris and from Mac Allen, it's about the same distance, I think. Isn't that yep. right, Brian? Yep. It's a it's a good drive. It's a good drive. Yeah. So well, very good. Well, thank you all. Appreciate thank your you. service. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to hear from you. All right. Well, that uh, are there any more hands raised? I don't see any. And um, I see no one attending by telephone. Okay. If I may take a moment, I will clarify the way I usually phrase it in my emails. And sorry, I'm better at writing than at speaking. <laughs> that you are authorized by your Texas license to provide services while you are physically in Texas and to a client who is physically in Texas. If you are physically outside Texas, you may need to be licensed by that jurisdiction. Or if you are in Texas, but under a federal jurisdiction, such as a military base, you may need to be authorized by that jurisdiction. They may recognize the Texas license, but that isn't necessarily a given. So I just caution that you be sure where your authorization comes from and that you have the appropriate authorization. I hope that's helpful. And so just on that note, if I'm if I'm if I'm the provider and I'm licensed in the state of Texas, but my client is in Nebraska for telehealth purposes, I I also have to be licensed in Nebraska under their under their rules to provide services in their state under current conditions. Possibly, I don't know Nebraska's rules. Sure. So some states, for example, during COVID recognized neighboring states, um, those COVID authorizations may still be in place or may have been repealed. And our Texas staff cannot keep up with the other 50 states or with Spain or yeah. with Guam or with et cetera. So the burden is on the licensee to know where their authorization comes from. If it's a Texas license, it's specific to Texas. And if they're outside of Texas, then they need to be sure and double check with the appropriate authority in the non-Texas jurisdiction. So the person who has a client in Spain needs to check with Spain and see yeah. what they do. Yes. I hope that, again, hope that's helpful. I'm, I welcome emails. I'll send it to you in writing. Um, and and hopefully the word gets out. Again, I'm I'm just hoping that people down the road aren't going to get um, get into a, a turmoil of, about it. So, and um, there's any FAQs? Yeah, we've got Tim's got a bunch of FAQ, or he's got a really good FAQ on this exact point. He does. He yeah. does. They're, they're, yeah. And they do have different scenarios. I'm here, but my client's there, or yeah. et cetera. And it, he's really done a lot of good work on it. And again, that goes back to this website, and 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 I can't promote it enough that. Um, when you first get on there, you may find it a little bit quirky and, and difficult to manipulate, but play with it for give yourself 30 minutes and you can figure this website out and get Pretty to good. the things that you need to. And and that saves licensees a lot of time. So. Um, all right. Well, that concludes public comment. We don't have we don't have any more that I saw um, on there. Um wanting to wanting to speak um we did hear uh from all three yeah yep. okay so we're we're done with public comment moving on to agenda item 22 which is announcement and announcements and comments not requiring board action statements regarding conferences and other recent or upcoming events and sarah has some that she will list here you want to go just go ahead and talk about them. um april 29th 
um, I'm sorry, April 19th, the, the 22nd was the ASWB meetings in New Orleans. Uh, we talked about that earlier in the meeting. March, I'm sorry, <laughs> I need another break. May 23rd is the council meeting. June 1st, um, ASWB has an online administrators forum, which I will attend as the Texas administrator. And I meet with administrators from um, other, uh, other jurisdictions. Um, that's an online meeting, so that's um, it's just a place to share ideas and what's going on. June 8th and 9th, ASWB has an uh, online new board member training. Um, so for the social work board members, if that's an, of interest to you, um, you can sign up for that. July 7th is the next meeting of this board, and then August 15th is the following council meeting. And after the July 7th meeting is when we'll re we will begin the three times per year schedule for fiscal year 2024. That's all that I have on my list. Is there anything the board members would like to add? Anything coming up there? I, I would add that um, sometime in, in August, there will be another ASWB meeting um, in Colorado, I don't remember the exact dates. Uh, just gonna look and see. So we'll just go ahead and add them. I think I put it in. Um, so it's in uh, August second, third, and fourth. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm sorry. August third, fourth, and fifth. There is an ASWB meeting. That's a um, research. I don't know. I don't know the exact. It's all the committees come together, so it's not open to the public, but it's it's a committee's meeting. Um, then, uh, Will, I don't, have, let's see, no, I do have NASW Texas. NASW Texas is, uh, I think, is October 12th through the 14th uh, is the NASW conference, and it's going to be again in Galveston this year, so you can put that on your on your list and then in November is that that's not the last year's no I've I don't got see it. a year on it okay that's why I've got it yeah I know it's I know it's in Galveston again and it's yeah okay. and it's the 12th through the 14th yeah that's right so you can look for that and then in November um and I don't have those dates in here I don't think uh, is the ASWB uh delegate assembly is sometime in November. Um, that's all I know about. Uh, anybody, anybody out there have anything they want to add to our uh, meetings list? All right, seeing none, hearing none. Uh, Sarah will have this updated and out to y'all. So, any other business that needs to come before the board at this time? All right, seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. I second. I have a motion by Audrey, a second by Katie. All those in favor, raise your hand and click your leave button. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see y'all in July. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. You have to leave.